Good morning. Good morning. Happy, happy Sabbath, Sabbath to you. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Barbara, David, and I are delighted to be with you this morning. We wish you all a blessed Sabbath. We are pleased that you have decided to join us virtually to study God's Word through the Sabbath School lesson. Barbara, will you pray for God's blessings on this morning's study? Absolutely. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, what an awesome study you have given us today. To look at your principles of tithing, Lord, it's a blessing to be able to give back to you, Lord, because you give us so much. We realize, Lord, that everything that we have is really yours. Amen. And so, Lord, when we give back, not only are we blessed for what you gave us originally, but you continue to bless us above and beyond. Amen. So, Lord, thank you for being with us, and we pray that your spirit will work mightily today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thanks so much, Barbara. Thank you. Our memory text for this week's lesson is found in Malachi 3.10, and I promise you that we are going to review that statement maybe four or five or six times. Malachi 3, verses 8, verses 9, and probably verses 10. Here's what the memory verse tells us. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. What an incredible promise that the, that the Lord has made. By the way, this is both a contractual agreement and a promise that God makes. So, as a brief overview to the lesson, and this is really your Saturday uh, section of the lesson, Psalm 24.1 reminds us that the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the word and all, the world and all who live in it. By the way, that's a NIV um, edition to that particular verse. At creation, God shared his possessions with humanity, and he continues to be the true owner of the world, its inhabitants and its goods. At the cross, Christ reclaimed as his own that which humanity had surrendered to Satan uh, when we sinned, when they sinned. Paul explains this way, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 19 and 20. He says, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God and you are not your own. And in verse 20 he says, for you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit which are God's. This suggests that we are doubly God's property. How, how is that possible? Well, first, because He created us. And secondly, because at the cross, Christ redeemed us. John 3.16 tells us, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. As Scripture explains in Genesis chapter 3, verses 17 to 19, and I'm not going to read that Scripture. I want you to read it. When sin came into the world, we lost it all. We lost what we had. We lost our relationship with Christ. That means that after the fall, God could no longer test our faithfulness to Him through the tree of knowledge of good and evil. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 18, God tells us to remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you and I power to get wealth. It comes from God, that He may establish His covenant which He swore to our fathers as it is this day. This verse of Scripture tells us clearly that God gives us the strength to acquire wealth through a covenant that He has established with us. Our acceptance of the covenant God has made with us includes our restoration, includes our development, restoration into God's image, our development, and the return of everything that we have and are to God. That means our time, it means our body, it means our talent, and it means our possessions. 
we should remember that the purpose of all God has given us, of all God provides, is to confirm and fulfill His covenant with us. As Lord and Creator of everything we are and everything we have, God has the right to require of us a tithe of all our possessions or an increase for the completion of His final work here on earth. After all, as Scripture tells us in Malachi chapter 3.10, and we've read that, if we are faithful stewards of God, God will open the windows of heaven to bless beyond measure. We've read that, so I'm not going to read it again. If we believe that God is the absolute owner of the world, its inhabitants, and its goods, then we understand that our, our responsibility, just like that of Adam and Eve uh, in the Garden of Eden, is to be responsible for the best possible use of those portions of God's possessions assigned to us. Thus, we become stewards, stewards of God's possessions. This recognition should lead us to determine to use everything entrusted to us in a way that will please God, the true owner of everything we are and everything we have. We are only stewards of God. Returning tithe is a covenant requirement. It is an act of faith that brings God's people closer to God. To, this, to this, disregard God's claims uh, to that which He has given us and to use it simply uh, as we please um, is seen by God as robbery. And He makes that statement. Here's how God defines it. Malachi chapter 3 Verses 8 and 9. Will a man rob God? Says God. Yet you have robbed me, he says. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? And he tells us, in tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, he says in verse 9. In this week's Sabbath school study of the tithing contract, we will study and review what is sin, and the tithing contract, where is the storehouse, what is the purpose of tithing, and what, is, what it means to be faithful with our tithe. So, Barbara, Sunday's lesson, what is tithe? What is tithe? Well, actually, in Sunday's lesson here, we're going to talk a little bit about what tithe is, but we're also going to look at some historical scriptures on tithe. And uh, the dictionaries define tithe as giving something, a part of something, a tenth part of something, or 10%. And most likely this definition came from the Bible. So it's simply returning 10% of our income or increase to God. We understand that all we have belongs to him in the first place. And, and that's, that's a hard concept sometimes for us to get down, is that we didn't do it ourselves but that really God has provided everything for us. The tithing legislation given to Israel at Mount Sinai at the whole, that the tithe is holy and completely belongs to God. Mm -hmm. So let's look first at Leviticus 27, 30 through, and 32. And all of the tithe of the land, whether the seed of the land or the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. And verse 32 says, And concerning the tithe of the herd of the flock, or whatever passes under the rod, the tenth one shall be holy to the Lord. So when I looked at that, I thought, what does it mean to pass under the rod? It has to be some kind of a, a counting right. system. Right. So I looked in the Bible commentary, and interestingly enough, uh, it, gives a, it gives a description of what happens. So... The, the rabbinical writers gives this explanation. When a man was to give the tithe of his sheep or calves to God, he shut the whole flock up into a, a fold or into a pen in which there would be a little narrow door capable of letting out one animal at a time. The owner about to give the tenth to the Lord stood with the rod at, at the door in his hand, and he would dip the end of it in a vermilion or ochre, which is a, a, a red, a red color, 
And then he would put the mothers of the lambs, of the calves or the lambs, just outside the pen. So when the door opened and the young ones ran out to the mothers, and as they passed by, the owner stood with his rod and touched every tenth sheep or calf. So he would stand and count every tenth. And he would dollop the head of that with the coloring. So whether it was poor or lean or perfect or blemished, no matter what this little calf or lamb looked like, it was considered a legitimate tithe. And then they would take these animals um, uh, to the temple. So God asks only for his 10%. Our offerings of gratitude are separate from and in addition to tithe. The tithe is the minimum testimony of our Christian commitment. Nowhere in the Bible do we find any indication that God's portion is less than a tenth. We see this tithing principle in the Bible that goes clear back to Abraham. And I find this story very interesting. We're going to look at it. It's in uh, Genesis 14, 18, 18 through 20. And then we're going to expand on it further in Hebrews but uh, Genesis 14, 18 through 20 says, The king Melchizedek, the Melchizedek king of Salem. So we see that this is a king. Bought, brought out bread and wine. He is the priest of the Most High God. So this, this person that, that, that we're talking about, this Melchizedek, is a king and a priest. And he, is ble and he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham, the God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the God most high who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave him tithe of all. Abraham even gave a tenth of his, of his war booty to God. And that just kind of, that, that kind of blows me away. Even what he, what he got in war, he considered that to go to God. Now Hebrews 7 expands on this in uh, verses seven, one, uh, chapter 7, one, verses 1 through 9. For Melchizedek, king of Salem and priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all first being translated king of righteousness, and thus also king of Salem, meaning king of peace. Without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, remains a priest continually. Now consider how great this man was, to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. And now it's, it's interesting, I'm going to stop here for a second, because this king, we really don't know who he is. We don't know his lineage. He just, he just kind of appears here on the scene as a king and a priest. Who does that represent? A king and a priest. Jesus. Jesus. Christ. Christ. Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Indeed, those who are of the son of Levi who received the priesthood have a commandment to receive tithes from the people according to the law. That is from their brethren, though they have come from the loins of Abraham. But he whose genealogy is not derived from them received the ties of Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. Now beyond all contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the better. Here mortal man receives ties, but he receives them of whom it is witnessed that he lives. One might even say, Levi, who receives the ties, paid the ties through Abraham. So we see that um, even, even the priests um, receive and give tithes. Mm -hmm. Now, we see that in Genesis, the this, this story in Genesis 14 tells us of Melchizedek meeting with Abraham. The last mention of tithe in the Bible recalls the same encounter. It's interesting that it begins with, with the story of Melchizedek and it ends with the story of Melchizedek. Note in the Hebrew story that neither Melchizedek or Christ were of the tribe of Levi. So the tithing proceeds and follows the selection of the Levites. So it's not exclusive to the Jewish uh, custom. 
and did not originate with the Hebrews of Sinai. We want to look at one more example, and that is the story of Jacob. Now remember, Jacob had a little problem with his brother, and when he uh, left home, he, he was um, leaving in a hurry. But one night he had a dream, and there was a staircase that ascended from earth to heaven, and the angels were going up and down on it, and God stood at the top and promised to be with Jacob and someday bring him back home. The single young man had a real con uh, conversion experience and said, Then Jacob made a vow, saying, If the God will be with me and keep me in this way that I am going, and give me bread and eat clothing to put on, so that I can come back to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone, which I set as a pillar, shall be God's house. And all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. So we see here even Jacob giving tithe to the Lord. So it's all important to understand that tithing, like Sabbath, was something that originated <coughs> with the ancient Israelite before even their legal or, or religious system. Absolutely. The patriarchs, even before Israel was formed, yeah. were already yeah. tithe givers. So Patriarchs and Prophets says the system of tithes and offerings was intended to impress the minds of men with great truth that God is the source of every blessing to his creatures and that to him man's gratitude is due for the good gifts of his providence. Amen. Thanks so much, Barbara. <clears throat> so we've, uh, we understand a little more now about a tithe, a tenth of that which God provides. <clears throat> David, where should the tithes go? Yeah, that is a wonderful, you know, um, question. It's probably a simple question for most of us, right, Victor and Barbara? We are Perhaps for most of for us. For most of us, yeah. But, but a lot of the people may not really quite understand. That's right. When the Lord told, talks about the, sto the, the storehouse, what yeah. does that mean? What is that? It actually, is the storehouse, but the problem rises because of our faithfulness right. to the storehouses where all, you know, Satan always... Right. Uh, derails us. You know, um, to start this, let's um, go to the slide number two, and I just wanted to tell you guys, on Deuteronomy 14, 22, 23, let's read that. You shall truly, what does that mean? Shall truly means you must. You must. It's a commandment, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tithe all increase of your grain that the field produces year by year. Right. Verse 23, and you shall eat before the Lord your God in the, in the place, there's a place, right. a physical place where he chooses to make his name Abide right. the tithe of your grain and everything else, right. so that what you may learn to fear or love or trust the Lord right. always. Right. So basically, where is the physical location of the tithe, the storehouse? It's where God lives. Okay, where does God live? It's church for us exactly. people, local church or local treasury, right. exactly. and that is. A very important concept. Now, a lot of us, you know, we want to think like, okay, I can do my own work, you know, and I can just, you know, spend for other things, and maybe I don't need to go to a local church and give my tithe. But we have to remember, Jesus came to a specific location on this planet to die, right? God built a specific tabernacle with Moses, right. specific direction. Right. So physical places on this earth has a significance, right. and that is where church, local church, comes to play as one of the storehouses right. for God's tithe. So uh, this is where God abides. We have to remember that. We may not sometimes feel it. We may sometimes not agree with it, but for me, is when I enter into this church campus, I'm looking at as the heavenly kingdom. Sure. And in that sense, this is where everything belongs, and that is very important to us. So slide number two, um, it, so for Israelites, it's been there, uh, you know, uh, this uh, tithe has been there, and it's for before the, before the Israelites settled in uh, to the land of Canaan, their storehouse was the tabernacle of meeting, exactly. and this is where um, Moses built, right. according to God. And then I, we remember that it was placed in Shiloh, 
and David was, uh, you know, wanting to uh, make a, a tabernacle, a temple for God, and he wasn't permitted, but right. later on, Solomon, Solomon built it. Did. And that exactly was the right. temple in Jerusalem. What's right. amazing about that is that temple, the physical presence, is also associated with the Ark of the Covenant. Sure. So tithe and Ark of the Covenant, the commandment, mm -hmm. it's a command, okay, right. to bring everything to the storehouse. Right. we got to remember that. It is not something like I feel like or I should or whatnot. It's a commandment. And then Malachi uh, 3.10, it says that um, God is commanding Everything, right? Bring everything to God. And he said it's a co covenant relationship. So exactly. going, taking tithe to this physical storehouse, it may not, say, you know, see uh, for some of us or for me, sometimes it may not feel that important, but it's actually a covenant relationship, okay? F so physically going there actually allows us to have that spiritual covenant relationship because right. God says what? He says, test me. Exactly. Test me. Yes. You know, and, the, and, and that's the most important thing. See, he says, be faithful to go to the storehouse and take your tithe and see what I can give you. Yeah. And what's the blessing if we take our tithe to the physical storehouse? Eternal life. Eternal life. You know, you know, so, ba you know, the basically. Here. Exactly. Yeah. So this, if our mm -hmm. physical storehouse, we got to remember this. Why take it to the storehouse? Because the physical storehouse on earth is equivalent to heavenly reward, eternal sto life, eternal storehouse, right? And so if we go, uh, and was, in this slide we see that God has a storehouse for wind, Jeremiah 10, 13, water, Psalms 33, 7, and hail, you know, you know hail and uh, snow in Job. So, but his most precious storehouse is where we bring the tithe. Why? Because it says, I give, in Numbers 18, 21, he says, I give to the Levites all the tithes in Israel as their inheritance in return for the work they do while serving at the tent of meeting. So again, where is the storehouse? Yep. Tent of meeting. Where do we meet God? Every Sabbath? Yep. At church. So that's where it happens. This is where the magic happens right here in Laguna Niguel. Okay. A storehouse is a place for where worship of God takes place. This is the first verse, number 1821. It actually says what storehouse is about. For the, uh, you know, the, some other names that God gave the uh, storehouse um, for is like the house of God, storerooms in the temple of the Lord, sure. and then, you know, um, also the house of God, the storerooms, treasury. So, the, you know, the question was, does who, who, who needs to bring tithe to the storehouse? Everyone. Everyone, Everyone because we're mm -hmm. all God's, uh, you know, creation. Mm -hmm. And to, if we really recognize it, then we won't be deterring, you know, going to different places to bring the tithe. We would bring it at the appropriate place, right. which is the storehouse. And the beauty of that is that this physical storehouse is under God's authority, right? So many times we feel like, you know, our physical storehouse may not be good because it's not run by good people. But guess what? God is in control. Like Samuel, Eli's children, they were not running the storehouse uh, properly. But again, that was under God's control. It's exactly. not for us to judge. To judge. We judge. You know, our job is to bring it because it is a covenant mm -hmm. relationship. Why? Because Ephesians 3, 17, 19, uh, 17 to 19, and let me read the verse 17. Right. For, then Christ will make his home in right. our heart as right. you trust him. Right. So storehouse, physical storehouse, the church, local church, that becomes conference then becomes general conference, then right. goes to worldwide. That's our Adventist tithe system. Right. What happens is when we faithfully bring tithe to the local church, our home becomes a storehouse too right. for God's blessing. Exactly. And that, that's really, really important, you know. And, and th that's what God says, that there will be food in my storehouse. Why? Because this physical storehouse can coordinate, has the resources to bring in more souls for God the bread and the living water, right, that right. Jesus promised us. So we have to actually bringing in uh, the stuff to the physical storehouse is actually helping uh, recognize that Jesus is coming soon. There's an urgency, and that's another thing. So physical storehouse is so important. Th uh, so we need to, you know, remember that. And it says in the, you know, it's at a, at a, it has to be, you know, at a dedicated time when for a dedicated people. So what was it for? Who was it for? It was for the? Levites, right? Sure. And who are Levites? People that work in the church and, right. and the lead in the, the tabernacle. Pe in the right. tabernacle. Right. And mm -hmm. for us, it's the people that work in the church. Right. It was the Levites. Right. Guess what? What's interesting is the Levites are the modern day Christian exactly. pastors and elders. Right. And, exactly. you know, so it's, it's actually 
if we bring tight, we're actually to the actual storehouse, right. your local church, you're actually supporting the church. Amen. You know, and that's, that's important. So uh, you do know that Seventh-day Adventist church, even though we are not that great in number, we have the second largest school system in the world, <clears throat> and we have the second largest health care. And, and this Absolutely. is amazing because... 70 over 7 is eight, close to 80% of our church income comes from tithe. And that is amazing. Right. And Mrs. Ellen White says that as God's work extends, call for help will come more and more frequently. Does these calls may be answers, Christians should heed the command. Right. Bring ye all the tithe into the storehouse. storehouse. So there can be so th uh, there can be food. So there would be, she says that if we truly give the tithe and bring it to the local storehouse, guess what? There will be no shortage of budget. Amen. The problem is, you know, we, we have other thoughts. So right. our goal from this, the storehouse is that, Lord, let, let us not forget right. where we should go because that is a command. Go to your local church and give your tithe because that is covenant relationship. That is eternal life for us. That is making my home a storehouse for heavenly right. blessings. Thank you. Thanks, David. Thank you. Tuesday's lesson, and, and David has already, to a certain extent, touched a little bit on that, but uh, uh, Tuesday's les lesson is about the purpose of tithing. Why is God tithing you and I? Why does God tithe? So, why did God instruct Israel, or for that matter, you and I, to, to pay tithe? First and foremost, because He owns everything, and He is entitled to tell us what to do with what He owns. This is why God tells us in Psalm 24, 1, 24, 1, and we read that earlier on, that the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. And in Haggai, Haggai is a minor prophet, uh, and it's towards the end of the Old Testament, that book. And chapter 2, verses 8 tells us that the silver is mine, says God. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. It is obvious that God does not need the money, nor any of the goods we have. But because the tithe is His, and He wants it, He tells us that we need to keep it holy and give it to Him. This is an instruction. This is not a request. This is really a contractual agreement that he has with you and me. Here's God's instruction as we read the, uh, in Scripture in Leviticus 27, chapter 30, verses 32. Barbara has already mentioned that. Let's read it. Uh, verse 30. All the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. And then verse 32 is... The Lord says, and concerning the tithe of the herd of the flock, of whatever passes under the rod, and Barbara spent time explaining what that is, the tenth one shall be holy to the Lord. So, what does God propose to do with the tithe? Why does He want it? What does He want to do with it? So, in Numbers chapter 18, verses 21 and 24, Numbers 18, 21, 24, the Bible tells us, Behold, I have given the children of Levi all the tithes of Israel as inheritance in return for the work which they perform, the work of the tabernacle of meetings. The tribal Levi was dedicated not only to the pastoral services, teaching Scripture and the law, but the tabernacle. Verse 24, for the tithes of the children of Israel, which they offer up as a heave offering to the Lord, I have given to the Levites as, his, as, a, an, as an inheritance. You see, in Israel, the tithe was used exclusively for the Levites, who did not receive tribal allotment. The Levites were not provided with large portions of land, as were the rest of the tribes of Israel, because they were to use all their time to foster Israel's worship, to minister at the sanctuary, and to teach the people the law of the Lord. The Levites were given certain cities, yes, including the cities of refuge, with enough land around them for personal garden. However, I want to emphasize this, their livelihood was supported by the tithes of all Israel, and they themselves 
also tithe their own income. After the crucifixion of Christ, when the divinely directed role of the Levitical priesthood ended, tithes were still to be used to support the ministry of God's church. Paul illustrates this principle as he explains and draws a parallel between the Levitical service and the newly established gospel ministry. And we're going to read that. Let's read 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 11 and 14. 1 Corinthians 9, 11 and 14. If we have sown spiritual seed among you, is it too much if we reap a material harvest from you? This is the question Paul asks. Verse 12. If others have this right of support from you, shouldn't we have it all the same or more? Verse 13. Don't you know that those who work in the temple get their food from the temple, and those who serve at the altar share in what is offered in, on the altar? Verse 14. In the same way, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. That's why tithe is given. Therefore, as God instructed, tithe needs to be given and used to take care of our ministers and pastors and to support gospel ministry and gospel outreach. Church members should be glad to bring their tithes to the storehouse to ensure that God's house is well taken care of. This is God's instruction. Malachi 3.10, the first part, is very clear. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house, that it can pay salaries and pay for the, for the work of ministry. Then, tithing is important because it helps us, in, in second place, tithing is important because it, it helps us establish a relationship of trust with God. To take one-tenth of our income and give it away, though technically it belongs to God anyway, truly is an act of our faith. And only by exercising it will we grow in faith to God. A second big reason for financial faithfulness is to access the tangible blessings God has promised as part of the contract. See, as part of the tithing contract, God has promised blessings that are so large that we won't have room enough to receive them if we're faithful. Malachi 3.10, the second portion. Let's read it again. Try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessings that there will not be room enough to receive it. With our, with, with our surplus... We can help others and help support the work of God with our offerings. You see, the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 20, verses 35, encourages you and I to do just that. Here's what Paul tells us in that verse. I have shown you in every way, by laboring like this, that you must support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, it is more blessing to give than to receive. It is, much, it is much better to give than to receive. We need to develop a trust in God and in His provid uh, providences, in His power, in His love. We've got to trust God. This will be a paramount importance when it seems as if all the world is against us. And by the way, we have entered the last years, the last the, 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 the last period of this world's history. And you, you and I are beginning to experience what that is like. This will be of paramount importance. Faithful tithing helps us learn to trust God regardless of our situation. I want to hand with a statement by Ellen G. White found in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 523, 523. She says, the system of tithes and offerings was intended to impress the minds of men with a great truth. And here's the truth. That God is the source of every blessing to his creatures and that to him man's gratitude is due for the good gifts of his providence. 
Barbara, how should we tithe how we income? Okay. So this is a question people often ask. Do I, do I give on the gross or do I give on the net yes. of my income? And it's, it, can be a, it can get to be a pretty heated emotional yep. uh, thoughts and talks. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share with you what the lesson has to say. Um, basically, studies of, of membership giving habits reveal that the majority of the Seventh-day Adventists tithe on the gross income. That is before taxes are taken out. In fact, according to the tithing principles and guideline published by the General Conference in 1990, tithes should be computed on the gross amount of wages or salary earners' income before legally required and other employee authorized deductions. This includes federal and state income tax, which provides for services and other benefits of responsibilities of citizenship, contributions for Social Security, may be subtracted from the guidelines. So I think that's, that's fairly, fairly clear. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I, if, if you own your own business, then you tithe on the increase right. that that brought, business brought in. Right. And then if you're paying, a, if you're paid a salary within that business, then you would tithe on the gross of that salary. That's what's recommended. Saying that, I do, want, I, would, I do want to say to you that tithing is very personal, and it is between you and God. And God will, if you, if you sincerely reach out to him, he'll tell you what he wants you to do. Amen. So we find that, <clears throat> um, that this concept of tithing was we, we've talked about it given at Sinai, but we see here that Moses, just before he died, gathered the people together and gave him, them a series of sermons. And in these sermons, this is what he had to say. It's Deuteronomy 12, uh, 10 and 11. But when you cross over the Jordan and dwell in the land which the Lord your God is giving you to inherit, and he gives you rest from all your enemies round about, so that you dwell safely. Then there will be a place where your Lord God chooses to make his name abide. So that's me. That was where they would build the temple. There you shall bring all that I command you, your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, the heave offerings of your hand, and all the choice offerings which you vow to the Lord. So we see that uh, Moses told the people, when you get to the, the promised land, you're going you're gonna to be building something, a, a temple to the Lord, and that is where you are to bring all of your tithes and offerings. Now, in the Bible, we see a, a story about the, the woman of Zarephath, and this talks about, this, this is, a, is really a sample of tithing. That's exactly right. Because, um, yeah, because we're going to see here what her, what her faith allowed her to do for Elijah, for her son, and for herself by doing this. And I mean, and this was, this was more than a tithe. This was basically all she had. So let's, let's read this. So it's 1 Kings 17, and starting in verse 9, Arise, and he's talking to Elijah, Arise and go to Zarephath which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. See, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. So this widow was God had prepared for Elijah. So he rose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, indeed, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Please bring me a little cup that I may drink of water. And um, she was, as she was getting it, he called to her and said, please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. So he, he had been traveling, and he, he was hungry, and he asked her for both food and water. So she said, as the Lord lives, I do not have any bread, only a handful of flour in a bin, and a little oil in a jar. And see, I am gathering a couple of sticks, that I might go prepare 
it for myself and my son that we may eat and die. She was at the end of her rope. She had nothing, nothing left. And here's how bold, <laughs> this is where the test really gets, gets interesting. And Elijah said to her, do not fear, go and do as you have said, but make me a small cake from it first and bring it to me and afterward make yourself and some for your son. So that's pretty bold on Elijah's part. Um, she, he knew that she didn't have enough, but he asked for what she had. Barbara, that's so nice. We brought that. This is a first fruit. Uh -huh. She remake the first. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So he goes, okay. make it for me first. first. And so that's really what God says to you. Give, mm -hmm. give me your tithe first. first. Yeah, right. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, the bin of flour shall not be used up, nor the jar of oil run dry until the day the Lord sends rain to the earth. So she went away and did according to the word of Elijah, and she and he and her household ate for many days. This was a true test of faith for this, this woman, and yet she was willing to give everything she had first. The bin of flour was not used up, nor did the jar run dry, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke to Elijah. So we see that this, this woman... Um, had amazing faith. She was willing to give to God and to his, his prophets what was needed for them first, even if it meant her own death. And when we, we were willing to give to God first, even if it means we do without, um, there's a huge blessing that comes. He, it, it doesn't run dry. In fact, I, one of my favorite psalms, and I've used it actually with, at work with a friend who was struggling and was he was wearing it psalms 37 25 i have been young and now i'm old yet i have not seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread and so this is similar to what we have here in this lesson ellen white in the testimonies said we have been told everyone to be his own assessor and is left to give as he purposes in his heart and that's why i said when we what we give to God is truly between us and the Lord. Right. And so, um, but we have to remember too, and she says in Patriarchs and Prophets, he, he gives life to all. God gives breath to all. He declares every beast of the forest is mine. The cattle on a thousand hills are his. Silver is mine. Gold is mine. And it is God who gives man the power to get wealth. We would not have wealth. We wouldn't have anything if it wasn't for God. Amen as an acknowledgement that all things came from him, the Lord directed that a portion of his bounty should be returned to, to him in gifts of worship. And to end this, I wanted to just share with you um, a statement from, um, with the quarterly comes, a, uh, we, get, we have a companion book. And this book is written by, uh, it's called Mass, Managing for the Masters by Ed Reed. On page 36, he says this. If you look at what the Israelites gave, it was at least one-fourth of their income to God in the form of tithes, offerings, support for the temple, and gifts to the poor. In addition, most of these donations were personally delivered by each family member in kind or cash equivalents to the central storehouse, which was first in Shiloh and then in Jerusalem. The personal delivery system required the Israelites to be away from home and work, at, and work for at least one month each year. So for one month each year, not only did they give 25%, but they didn't work that, that, that one month. Um, yet, given that 25% and being away from home for one month was actually the basis for their prosperity and blessings, and they knew it. Wow. Amen. Thanks so much, Barbara. <clears throat> It's, it's a, David, yeah. Thursday's lesson really yeah. is uh, pivotal yeah. because it really says, look, you've got to be faithful. Yeah, you know, thank you for this opportunity to have that, that yes. topic because yeah. honestly, Hebrew 11.6, it says, without faith, it is impossible, impossible to please God, but those who come right. to him must believe that he is. Victor mentioned this, because God said so, it is. Right. Do we believe that? If we do, tithing exactly. is a, one of the pivotal 
part of our life. Right. That's really the key. So in 1 Corinthians 4, 1, 2 says, Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Wow, we are servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. What an honor. Moreover, it is required to in stewards that one be found. Right. What? Faithful. Faithful. It's faithful. faithful. So, you know, this journey in this, er, in this world is all about being faithful. Because I realized that one of the things um, that uh, was, um, I, w- you know, I was thinking about, in the Garden of Eden, Victor, what was the most beautiful fruit? The tree of knowledge of good and evil. Because right. Eve was amazed by it. It's okay, the taste, you know, and what he would do. God said, leave that fruit for me, the tree alone. But what do they do? They don't leave it for God, right? right? They are not faithful there. And that's brought down this curse, right? right. For all the humanity. So, um, you know, this is the key for all of us to be heavenly citizens. So in a way, tithing was even in Garden of Eden. You know, that was the concept God was treating, uh, teaching Adam and Eve. So what we really find out is that our faith is needed to see God's faithfulness. Right. Okay, our faith is needed to see God's faithfulness. And faithful is, uh, being faithful is beneficial for everyone. I think Barbara mentioned that about, um, you know, when we uh, give tithe, guess what? Everybody's benefited. The Sunamite, the, the lady, right? The, she gave, um, made the first uh, fruit. Right. And what happened? Uh, every, her son Everybody was benefited, and the right. God's work was prospering. So giving tithe is not just beneficial to us if we do it faithfully. The whole community, mm-hmm. our whole church benefits. As you see, the, the, what, what did tithe do to our whole church? This Adventist church is one of the church that goes almost all the countries in the world. Right. It is the most uh, you know, uh, known, well-known church in most countries in the world. Why? Because tithing is very important because it is a testimony of our faithfulness to God. So the, the, there's like four you know, components about tithe. And again, we, we know about the amount, like Barbara was talking about, gross. You know, God first comes first. So gross should be before net, right? Uh, so the amount, which is tenth, taken to a specific place, which is the storehouse, and then honoring God with our first, everything first, right? And then the fourth one is people who are in charge of the, of the storehouse, they need to do the ministry of God. So the first the three things, the amount, 10%, taken to the storehouse and giving the first part of our anything that we have is something that what we can do faithfully. Sure. Because if we got to do it faithfully, because what does Jesus say to his, um, uh, to the, you know, this parable in Matthew uh, chapter 25, verse 19 to 20? He says that uh, to the servant that brought, you know, doubled his income mm-hmm. and he gave it back to the master, he said, my faithful servant, you are faithful in little things so that, uh, you know, you can be trusted with big things. So it is so important for us to have realized the faithfulness, the practice of faithfulness in giving tithe right. on a regular basis. Not There is no strings attached to it. Why? Because God owns everything. Right. And when uh, Barbara mentioned, you know, uh, you and Barbara mentioned about right. the treasures on right. this earth, there is no treasure on this earth. Jesus Christ is the only treasure we have. And since he's the priest forever, and he gave us everything, mm-hmm. we need to show that faithfulness to him by right. giving things back so more people can come to God. So this is so, so important. See, in the, uh, Luke 10, 16, uh, Luke uh, chapter 16, verse 10 to 12, it, uh, I like this. It says, it says uh, verse, uh, reading from verse 10, He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, guess what? Money is labeled as unrighteous unless it's for tithe. And that's just God's <laughs> blessed. It's, yeah. It's, so, you know, we don't realize that. You know what? Let's look at tithe. Giving tithe faithfully is like a retirement reward. It's an, it's an 100% retirement reward. Let's not waste it by being unfaithful. That's, that's what it's, you know, we really need to realize that. And, and, and then the fourth one, you know, like a lot of people have complaints. They say, oh, you know, my church, I don't think they're doing a good job. You know, all these complaints we have about people, right? Uh, what does the Bible say about the fourth part of the tithe, that the people that are assigned to take care of God's money? I go to 1 Timothy 2, 1, 2, 3. What does Paul say? Therefore, I exhort first of all, all the supplications, prayer, 
intercessions and giving thanks be made for all men, for kings, and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence, for this is good and acceptable to the sight of God. So our job is to give the tithe, the 10%, take it to the storehouse, and first come a part of everything. But when it comes to what the people are in charge of that money, we need to be praying for them. Instead of accusing them or thinking anything else, remember, they are also under God's authority. We need to be praying for them. And that's important. Otherwise, we will miss God's plan in our life. And we also know that blessing, blessing, faithfulness equals to blessing. We also learned that tithing is a covenant connection. It's a covenant relationship. Right. And there is, you know, God said it, and God is going to say, okay, right. you, are, you showed your faith. I'm going to show your faithfulness, uh, my right. faithfulness. It's a covenant relationship. I mean, what, you know, covenant relationship is irrelevant, guess what, if we're not faithful. Right. Can I make a covenant relationship with you, uh, Victor? No. It's That's irrelevant, right. right? So tithing unfaithfully is, guess what? It's like being committing adultery with God over and over again. Mm -hmm. it's, the, it's really a, a terrible thing. I mean, now that I think about it that way, you know, it's something, if, God, if we truly love God, we don't want to commit adultery with Him over and over again. So that's why tithing is, uh, you know, very, very important. It is faithful love. And that's what, you know, this Sabbath school lesson is trying to teach us. See, our, our Adventist church has gone through some, you know, struggles during the COVID time. But... I really want to just, you know, bring out this one component. The tithing has been the same. So it's a great thing that we are, you know, showing that, you know, that we really love the Lord. But we are facing a tremendous challenge, right? We have new generation and everything new. So we're going to need more help. So what we have to do is start thinking about how we can help God, you know, and the best way to do that is to be faithful. Always pray for being faithful. What does the Spirit of pro Prophecy says? Spirit of Prophecy says that, um, that bringing the sacred tithe to the storehouse is the model representation in, in Scripture. In every dispensation, God has had a central storehouse to manage the tithe. Seventh-day Adventists make up a worldwide religion church in which the storehouse principle is accepted, and practice. Members are encouraged to return their tithe to the conference mission through the local church. So what happens when we do all this? Guess what happens when we do all this? Not only just we are benefited, our church is not benefited, but the whole world. Because why? We are all getting ready for the second coming of Jesus. Jesus. And that's yeah. the key, right? Yeah. What is the third angel's message? We need to get out of there. Tithing right. is really one of the best ways to show God that we are faithful for his second coming. We're excited about it. And we, go ahead. Well, it also gives us the ability to reach the world. Reach exactly. The world. That's, that's the way it. we do it. And that's you know, exactly that's right. exactly. And guess what? This is a physical evidence when we tithe that Satan cannot bring us any accusation. Why? Because we truly are faithful to God. And that's how God can bless us. So, my, my friends, as we are coming to a, you know, a end uh, to a, uh, for this lesson, remember tithing, tithing is the most faithful duty, one of the most faithful duty that we can show not only to God, but to our own heart, but to everybody else around us. And Amen. that is the model for every Christian. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, David. Thank you so much. Thank you, Barbara. Um, I, I just want to uh, very briefly encourage you to be faithful. I think really this lesson teaches an incredible lesson to you and to me, and that is God is the provider of everything we are and everything we have. That includes the, the, the work environment in which we are on. It includes um, everything else that, that, that we receive mm -hmm. from God. Yeah. It is God that provides. And knowing that God is interested in a relationship with you and He is the provider, he really wants a relationship that has a quid pro quo. That's right. A relationship that says, you know, God, you are so faithful to everything that I have, my being, uh, the work environment, my physical being, my mental being, and, uh, and everything that I have around me. You are so faithful to that that I really want to recognize that, faith, that faithfulness that you've got. And so, this is really a test. The tithing contractual agreement is a test, test, a test that God has placed with us. 
Because, you know, the Lord says, Victor, I want you to be a part of me, but I want you to respond positively about the relationship with God. Therefore, God instituted the system of tithes and offerings to remind us that He is the source of everything, every blessing. It was the system that provided the financial means for supporting the priesthood of the Israelite temple. Mm -hmm. And it is the system that provides the means to spread the gospel, the three angels' message throughout the world. So tithe belongs to the Lord, and He requests that we return it to Him. Seventh-day Adventists have adopted the Levitical model as a sound biblical method for financing a worldwide outreach of the gospel. And Dr. David was very clear in specifying not only the medical, education, but the pastoral. We are a global function. Mm -hmm. okay? God has ordained that sharing the good news to the world is to be dependent on the efforts and offerings of His people, mm -hmm. you and I. God tells them to become faithful co-laborers with Him by giving tithes, and offerings to Him. Mm -hmm. That's really what the God does. Mm -hmm. God increases and decreases really often on the basis of how much are we being co-laborers with God, mm -hmm. That's the, basically. Ellen White, I want to close with the statement from Ellen White. Ellen G. White in Testimonies for the Church, Volume 6, pages 384, tells us, and this is an appeal, it's really an appeal. All of us should remember that God's claims upon us underline every other claim. He gives to us bountifully, and the contract which He has made with men is that a tenth of His possessions shall be returned to God. The Lord graciously entrusts to His stewards, and you and I, are God's stewards when we embrace His blessings. His treasures, uh, says Ellen White. She goes on to say, but of the tenth, he says, this is mine. This is what God's saying. God says, the tenth is mine. Mm -hmm. Just in proportion as God has given His property to man, some man is to return to God a faithful tithe of all His substance. She, she says, she, she says, as, as the last statement in this, um, in, in this uh, statement in Testimonies for the Church, this distinct arrangement was made by Jesus Christ himself. He is our Lord, Creator, mm -hmm. Redeemer. Redeemer. Sets a contract with us, mm -hmm. which is a tithing contract. Yeah. Comes down to earth and makes sure that we understand that that contract is still on. Yes. So I just want to encourage you to be a faithful steward of God and to faithfully fulfill an obligation. And you, you know what, what the Lord has told you in, uh, in Malachi 3, uh, chapter 3, verses 10. He says, test me. test me. Just test me, says the Lord of hosts. I will, if I will not open for you, the windows of heaven, and pour out for you such blessings that there will be no room enough to receive it. Yeah, what an incredible promise. Let's pray. Yes. Gracious Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you so much for your amazing grace. First and foremost, you created a world and everything in it. And secondly, you created us in your own image. Yes. And then, Lord, you turned around to us and said, I want you to enjoy what I have provided for you. And Lord, at some stage, we, we obviously failed. Our first parents did fail. And we lost. We lost the opportunity to have what you created. And your amazing love was such that you came, you left your throne in heaven, and you came down to this earth. You took on humanity. And Father, because of love, because of that incredible love, 
You gifted yourself to us on that cross so that you could die our death in order for us to be able to be saved by you and live with you and into eternity and become part of your family. And in so doing, Lord, you've restored a link with us. And you continue to gift us with everything we need. And Lord, all, all you've asked from us is a return of a faithful tithe, a 10% of what you give us. And you're really saying, that 10% I'm going to use to make myself known in the world, to provide people in the world with an opportunity to be saved, and to provide people with an opportunity to know who I am, my character, and what I want from each one of them. What a privilege, Lord. And so, you have called us stewards, and we want to be stewards. We want to be faithful stewards. So, I want to ask, O oh Lord, that you, through the Holy Spirit, embed in our minds every day, throughout the day, the ability to remember that whatever we touch, whatever we have is yours, and that we need to manage it according to your will, and that, Lord, we need to take care not only of, of, of the contract that you've established, but every one of our neighbors, our, the, the human beings that we come into contact with. Help us to be stewards, Lord, stewards of heaven, your stewards that you're proud of. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Have Happy a Sabbath. wonderful day. Thank you.